this is Sarajevo, the capital of Bosnia and Herzegovina. The word diverse doesn't do this city any justice. Sarajevo is a bridge between east and west, a cradle of cultures and a religious melting pot. It is, however, also a historic powder keg. Few cities have suffered like Sarajevo in the last 100 years. Today I'll take you on a tour of the past, present and future of this fascinating city. I will divide the story into four parts, each covering a different historical era and its corresponding sites. Welcome to Sarajevo, a city that has risen from the ashes. Snipers were shooting. Welcome to Sarajevo. My friend died. Now this city is often called the Jerusalem of Europe and today I'm going to show you why. So we are now in the center of Sarajevo here and the first thing that we see is a huge cathedral. Have a look. This is the cathedral of the nativity of Theotokos and it was built in the 1860s. Now I can't film inside so I can only show you the outside but yeah this is the first big church in the center of Sarajevo. So here is the Christian Orthodox Cathedral and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you how long it takes to walk to the next religious site. Spoiler alert, it doesn't take very long. And this is it, the Catholic Croat Sacred Heart Cathedral. And just like the Orthodox Church, you can't film inside. But yeah, it's located just one street from the Christian Serb Orthodox Church, which is over there behind those buildings. And yeah, that is Sarajevo. Now I'm gonna walk to the next religious monument, which, same thing, isn't far away. This right here is Ferradia, which is the main pedestrian zone of Sarajevo. And you can see that you have many different types of architecture here because you have buildings that come from the Austrian period and then over there in the distance you have buildings that are from the Ottoman period. Now here we have the Sarajevo meeting of cultures sign and this is very interesting because on this side we have the pedestrian zone which looks very European and a lot of buildings here are from the Austrian times but then on the other side we have a completely different neighborhood. Have a look. Now, on the other side of the sign, we have what is called the Basharjia. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, but this is the old Ottoman quarter. So this doesn't look like Europe at all. This looks way more Middle Eastern. And here we have a very important mosque. Now we are entering the courtyard of Ghazi Huzraf Beg Mosque. And this mosque right here was built in the 16th century during Ottoman times. So in the 16th century, Bosnia was part of the Ottoman Empire and they obviously built lots of mosques. And this mosque right here is actually the largest mosque in the Balkans. So let's go have a look inside. So that was Ghazi Huzraf Beg Mosque, the biggest Ottoman mosque in the Balkans. And yeah, that is the most fascinating thing about Sarajevo. You got these two big cathedrals and then this mosque right here, just within a few hundred meters from one another. I mean, where else do you have this? Jerusalem. Now you might be wondering where all this diversity comes from, so here's a brief historical overview. Before the 15th century, several villages were scattered around the valley of modern Sarajevo, but there was no major city. In the 1450s, the Ottomans conquered the region and annexed it into their growing empire. 1461 is usually mentioned as Sarajevo's founding date. 
That year, the first Ottoman governor of Bosnia built a governor's palace called Saray in Turkish. That palace gave the city of Sarajevo its name. Most residents were Christian at the time, and even though the Ottomans introduced Islam, the Christian population remained stable. Furthermore, during Ottoman times, Sarajevo's economy flourished, and lots of people moved to the city from all over the Balkans, creating even more diversity. Until the late 19th century, the Ottoman province of Bosnia became a colorful mix of Catholics, Orthodox Christians, Muslims and a few minorities, including a sizable Jewish population. So yeah, this is the Basharjia. I hope that I say that at least a little bit correctly. This is the Ottoman Bazaar area and you got all the coffee shops here, you got the tea houses and then you also got lots of restaurants. I mean, yeah, this really reminds me of Turkey. We even got a Turkish ATM there. So yeah, if you put these streets into any Turkish city, then most people wouldn't know the difference, except for the language, of course, because here in Sarajevo, they speak Bosnian. Here we have Sebilje Fountain, built in the 18th century. And yeah, there is a legend here that if you drink from this fountain, you will return to Sarajevo. And well, I drank from it eight years ago, and I'm back. So the legend holds true. Here we are. So that means that I am going to return to Sarajevo sometime in the future again. And I have absolutely no problem with that because this is a fantastic city. Sarajevo's Ottoman period ended in 1878 when Bosnia was occupied and later annexed by Austria-Hungary. During Austrian times, lots of recognizable structures sprang up in Sarajevo, including the iconic city hall. The Austrian dominion, however, ended rather abruptly in the early 20th century. Now, the Balkans and Sarajevo in particular were often referred to as the powder keg of Europe. And that is because a lot of wars started here, but none bigger than the First World War. So let's go have a look at the place where it started. On a sunny day in June 1914, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, had the brilliant idea to visit Sarajevo. And by brilliant, I mean terrible. At this point, the annexed province of Bosnia was a hotbed for resistance against the Austrians. While driving along in his convertible, Franz Ferdinand got himself killed by a Bosnian Serb teenager called Gavrilo Princip. And the rest is history. So yeah, I'm not gonna recount the entire history of how the First World War started, but this assassination here in Sarajevo was basically the spark. Because after the murder of Franz Ferdinand, Austria made Serbia responsible, and then they gave Serbia an ultimatum, which Serbia rejected, and then Austria invaded Serbia, and then Germany joined, and then Russia joined, and then France joined, and then Britain joined, and then one month later, the world was at war. After World War I, Bosnia became part of the Kingdom of Serbs, Slovenes and Croats, which would later become Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia was stable and relatively prosperous until the 1990s, when the powder keg exploded once more. Behind me in the building over there you can see bullet holes. And these are not fake. These are actual scars from the terrible wars that happened here in the 1990s. Without going too much into detail, here are some basics about the Bosnian War. In 1991, the republics of Slovenia, Croatia and Macedonia broke away from the multi-ethnic state of Yugoslavia. Bosnia would be next. At this point, the Republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina was split between around 44% Muslim Bosniaks, 32% Orthodox Serbs and 17% Catholic Croats. In 1992, a referendum for independence was held. The Muslims and Croats voted in favor, but the Bosnian Serbs boycotted the referendum. Bosnia declared independence from Yugoslavia and this declaration received international recognition. The Bosnian Serbs, however, didn't want to be part of this new republic. They allied themselves with the remaining parts of Yugoslavia and the Yugoslav People's Army, which was mostly made up of Serbs. For the next three years, the country was engulfed in a terrible civil war. Now, there is one episode of the war that we absolutely have to mention, the Siege of Sarajevo. This city right here was besieged for 1425 days, the longest siege in modern history. Way longer than Stalingrad and way longer than Berlin. 
To learn more about it, I visited the siege museum. During the war, the Bosnian Serbs formed an entity called Republika Srpska. Together with the Yugoslav People's Army, they blockaded Sarajevo. The city was beleaguered from all sides and cut off from food, water and electricity supplies. Every time the inhabitants went out, they were exposed to sniper fire. Over 8,000 soldiers and 5,000 civilians lost their lives during the siege. Later that day, I took a taxi ride along what used to be called Sniper Avenue. The driver, who spoke very good English, explained what life was like during the siege. It was normal to go to school. Even grenades are, were falling, snipers were shooting. You see, this is Sniper Avenue. Yeah, they were shooting from all these houses. You will see now. Uh, here at this crossroad was uh, settled uh, United Nations containers. Uh -huh. to protect us so we can run over this crossroad. Oh yeah. My friend died oh, I'm sorry. from a sniper shot right here and you see that left you see that houses they were shooting from those houses at this crossroad. Wow. Same like crossroad before you see that a lot of Bomb shells, sniper shots on this building. During the Bosnian war, several atrocities were committed on both sides. But the most infamous one was the Srebrenica massacre. In less than one month, the army of the Republika Srpska murdered more than 8,000 Bosniak Muslims around the town of Srebrenica, which had been defined as a UN safe zone. The events were classified as a genocide by the International Court of The Hague, but some countries dispute that definition. The Bosnian war ended in 1995, when the US mediated a peace treaty in Dayton, Ohio. Today, the country is at peace but remains ethnically split. Many scars will never heal, but most Bosnians look forward. We've talked about the war, the religious history, and the fact that Sarajevo is a bit of a powder keg but we also got to talk about the 1984 Winter Olympics because that was another very memorable episode in Sarajevo's eventful history. Before checking out some actual Olympic sites, let's first learn something about these very special games in the museum. Inside the Olympic Museum now, and first of all, we got to talk about why these Olympic Games were so special. Now, this was 1984 and the Cold War was still in full swing, so you needed a place that both Western and Eastern countries would accept. Because in 1980, the Olympic Games were held in Moscow and a whole host of Western countries actually boycotted them. And during the Cold War, Yugoslavia had friendly relations with both the East and the West. They were a leading member of the non-aligned movement, so they weren't part of any of the two blocs. But politics was just one of the reasons why Sarajevo was chosen. The natural landscapes around the city are perfect for Winter Olympics. And yeah, the Olympic Games were a massive success. Hundreds of thousands of people came. Nobody boycotted them. And they also lifted Sarajevo's appeal as a tourist destination. Because Sarajevo was mostly a provincial city in Yugoslavia, but not a major tourist destination for people from outside of Yugoslavia. That was the museum. Now let's go and have a look at some of the remnants of these Olympic Games. Alright, we have made it to Mount Trebevic and this is one of the locations where the 1984 Olympic Winter Games took place. Now the interesting thing about this area is that there are some abandoned bobsledding tracks that were used during the 1984 Winter Games. So let's see if we can find them shouldn't be too difficult. But as you can see here, the city of Sarajevo is surrounded by mountains and forests and it is just a perfect location for any type of winter sports. Today is May the 1st, so there is no more snow here, but I was actually told that the skiing slopes that are a few kilometers that way were open just a couple of weeks ago. So yeah, it gets very cold and very snowy up here. So I think that this is where the bobsledding track starts, so you can just walk over it and use it as a hiking path. Pretty cool. So yeah, this is the old bobsledding track, the starting point where the bobsleds would go down and then they would continue here. Wow, this is cool. We got some street art in the distance, so you'll see that in a minute. But yeah, this is an abandoned Olympic bobsledding track. 
This is a really cool place and the street art actually adds an artistic touch to it, which makes it even more worthwhile coming here. We are now continuing on the abandoned bobsled tracks and here you can see a junction. So there were sleds coming from that direction and then from over here. And yeah, I don't really know how far down these tracks go because these Olympic sleds had quite a lot of speed and power back then. And most parts now have street art on them. I think they did this really well, I have to say. I wasn't sure whether it was worth coming here, whether it would just be some small tourist attraction, but it's the entire track, which is really cool. And of course the track is derelict and abandoned, but it is still whole. There are no gaps in it. Right, so along the trail that leads back down to the city, I found some pretty insane buildings. Have a look. These might have actually been houses where people were living. And yeah, they were completely blown up and then shot to pieces. Just look at the bullet holes. I mean, it's impossible to count them, but yeah, these used to be buildings 30 years ago. Alright guys, that was the past of Sarajevo. Now it's time to move on to the present and maybe talk a bit about the future as well. So, what is Sarajevo like today? Well, apart from religious sites and war museums, there is a pretty cool bar and coffee shop scene. I think that the title Rebirth applies to this city because it is today a vibrant and exciting European capital. And then there is the food. Alright, I just sat down at a local restaurant here called Zalio and the main staple here is Cevape. Have a look. These are the cevape, mixed meat sausages, and nobody really knows what's inside. But yeah, they are served with this bread here, and then this cream and onions. So let's try. Fantastic. After the cevape and some strong Bosnian coffee, I visited one of the city's best viewpoints. The observation deck on the top floor of Ava's Twist Tower. All right, we are now at the viewpoint of Ava's Twist Tower here, which is the tallest building in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And it opened in 2008 and is 172 meters tall. So, what does the future hold? Well, I came here eight years ago and noticed some significant improvements this time around. The city is cleaner than it used to be, more young people are starting companies and working in Bosnia, and the tourism infrastructure is better than it was in 2015. Of course, Bosnia and Herzegovina still has massive corruption and economic problems. Nevertheless, the rebirth is in full swing and I hope that Bosnia has a bright future. Thanks for watching.